Hi, it's Jesse. Today on the show, you know him from Netflix's hit show Heartstopper and his debut run on Broadway as Tobias Rag and Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barbara Fleet Street. It's Joe Locke. Most of my friends are at university and getting drunk and snogging someone in an alleyway. Yeah, yeah. Like all these like things you do when you're 20. And whilst actually I don't want to do that, knowing I can't do that yeah. is slightly annoying. This is Dinners on Me, and I'm your host, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Joe Locke gave a stunning performance in his breakout role as Charlie Spring in Netflix's Heartstopper, a queer coming-of-age story that I honestly wish had been around when I was younger. Now, at 20 years old, he's taking on Broadway in Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, and is set to star in Marvel's upcoming series, Agatha, Dark Hole Diaries, which is out later this year on Disney+. I was especially excited to have a meal with Joe, not only because I'm a big fan of his, but I was curious what it was like to have your first TV show be so enormously popular, and then the added context of being openly gay on top of that. I mean, being out today is much different than it was when I was 20, so I'm curious to dig into that as well. Also, I need to hear more about his texts with Broadway icon Patti Lapone, right? Oh, hi, you snuck up on us. <laughs> How are you? I brought Joe to Jack's wife, Frida, in Soho. This stylish and casual cafe is named after, um, well, uh, Jack's wife, Frida. (laughs) The couple were immigrants who met and married in Johannesburg in 1930. Nearly 80 years later, their grandson, Dean, and his wife, Maya, opened the restaurant in their name to celebrate the warmth and comfort of the kind of home that they built. The menu features dishes from their childhoods in Israel and South Africa with an emphasis on fresh, bright ingredients like their green shashuka, which is a favorite of Joe's. Jack's Wife Frida is one of my favorite places to eat when I'm in New York City, and I was so excited Joe agreed to meet me on his day off from Sweeney Todd. Oh, I I should also mention he was also just coming from a dentist appointment, so (laughs) I was very touched Joe made time for me. Okay, let's get to the conversation. Um, I am so excited to sit down with you. I've been such a fan of yours for so long. Oh, well, I mean, I've been a fan of yours for so long as well. And I was so thrilled when I first met you just a few weeks ago uh-huh. at uh, the closing performance of yes. Shucks, which is in a very, it's a very American show. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. always seeing a closing show is always special. Well, I'm glad. I was, I was wondering because I was sitting two seats away from you. I was like, I wonder if he's getting all these references because it's very, like, very I think American. I spent I spent six months last year in Atlanta. Yes. And I think if I hadn't done that, half the southern jokes would have gone right over my head. <laughs> but I understood like most of all the jokes. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was Atlanta the first place in the States that you lived for like a long yeah. period of time? Yeah. That is a very that that talk about culture clash. Oh I know, yeah. I love Atlanta. I love Atlanta. But it's a very unique place. It's the most like diverse and amazing and cultured place I've ever been to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was there for six months, and the first month, I hated it. I, I hated it. I was staying in a not very nice part of town. Uh, my car got broken into twice in one week, which was so annoying. Yeah. The second time I went, I was getting in the car to pick my mom, my mom up from the airport. And I was like, why can I hear the outside world? I haven't opened the windows. I turned my head, and suddenly, glass is all over the floor. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, God's sake, again. It happened twice? That was the se- it happened twice in a week. Oh, my God. Yeah. I just saw, this is a very LA moment. I just saw Catherine Hahn at the hair salon. Amazing. We also do Pilates together, ironically. Amazing. And I told her I was seeing you, and her face lit up so bright. And she just adores you. I, yeah. I, and ironically, tonight, after I'm done with this, I'm being honored at the Vineyard Theater Gala. Oh, wow. And Patti Lapone is singing for me. Oh Which my god. Is, I'm sure you understand yeah. a huge, huge thing. Yeah. Um, and she as well, I sent her a text and said I was sitting down with you and she's like, I've never met anyone more self assured <laughs> and more like comfortable in their skin than Joe. She absolutely loves you. I love both of them so much. I, I like mean, what's it like to like be friends and text with Patty Lapone now? It's <laughs> it's crazy and amazing and like it's not like a real thing. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's weird. I think some people think I just say this because 
I am now happy to be friends with her. She is and has always been one of my idols. Me too. Like, getting to know her as a person is one of the things I'm most grateful for in my life. Because, yeah. it, like, they say don't meet your idols, but I'm very glad that I met her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and got to know her. You, of course, are doing um, Agatha. Agatha Dark Called Diaries. Right, right, which is a spin off of the. One um, Division. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that shot in, uh, that's why you were in Atlanta. I was in Atlanta, yeah. And um, so, obviously, you and Katherine Hahn and Patti Lapone uh -huh. and Aubrey Plaza. Yeah. Uh, it's an incredible cast. Mm -hmm. But because I know you came off of Heartstopper, which was you were with your contemporaries, yeah. you were with people that you, you know, were around your same age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To then be plucked out of, <laughs> out of you, your comfort zone, put into Atlanta. Yes. Working with these kind of massive talents mm -hmm. that are very American as well. Yeah. Talk about like navigating that transition for you. Um, I was so out of my depth that it almost made it easier for the fact that I had no idea what I was doing or that I just like ended up going in knowing nothing and being therefore open and just absorbing everything from yeah. other people. And like, I, I learned so much from every single one of those yeah. women and it was also the most amazingly warm, incredible set, and they all made me feel so... I never felt like I was the new kids, or yeah. that I... I never felt like I didn't deserve to be there as, as much as they did, um, which is just a testament to them and how amazing... You know, it's interesting. Nick, I don't know if you'll find this more as you continue to work, but, like, I find that the people who are um, super accomplished in their careers and, like, you know, these people that I idolize are always the ones, are usually the ones that I find to be the most down to earth and the easiest to get to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, Patty, I just, I guess I assumed when I first met her that she would be hard to get into and yeah. she would, but she's so generous and so, so generous. lovely so... and comes at you with open arms. And I was like, of course, of course, Patty Lapone, who course. doesn't have to be that way, uh -huh. is that way. Yeah. Yeah. People think of Patty Lapone, they think of the very no nonsense talking, straightforward. Yeah. It will cut you down if you cross a yeah. woman. Which she is. Yes. And she's proud of that. Yeah. But what they therefore, I guess, therefore they don't expect her to be the warm, lovely Italian grandmother that she is. Yeah, right. Um, which is more so her than anything else. And yeah. the thing I think I learned the most from her is like owning the respect that you deserve from other people. Whilst not being rude and not being in any way bad about it, but like owning, yeah, owning the respect that you know you deserve. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, she certainly <laughs> demands respect. <laughs> yeah. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I, I'm gonna get the candle juice. Candle juice? Can I for you? Can I get an oat milk flat white? Yeah. I might take a coffee as well. Do you know what you want to eat as well? Are you gonna get that green shashuka? Yeah. Oh. All right, green shashuka for, for Joe. So the green shashuka is spicy in the egg probably, is that fine? Can I get the eggs hard? Yeah, thank you. I'm a widow, don't like runny yolks. I'm going to have the um, the grilled eggplant baguette. And can we get, um, I know you already have some on your plate, but I'm gonna get the grilled halloumi as well. Thank you. Um, I have never heard of the Isle of Man. Uh huh. So I, as I was doing my research on you, I was like, yeah. this is new for me. <laughs> So the Isle of Man, where you were raised, where you yeah, grew up, I grew up, was it's in between the UK and Ireland. Yeah, it's just it's a, it's an actual isle. Yeah, I assume it's an isle. <laughs> it's an island, and it's a very small population. Uh huh. And that's where you grew up. Yeah. You were also born in 2003, and from yes. what I understand, they only legalized homosexuality in the Isle of Man in like 10 years before you were born. Yeah, 1992. That's. And even then, they only did it because they had to. Yeah. Um, the, the Isle of Man is, so we're, it's called a crown dependency, which means we have our own government, we make our own laws, we have our own head of, head of government, and, um, but the UK is still kind of overall. It, yeah. it never has, um, but has the power to, because we're a yeah. crown dependency rather than a state, um, and they're in charge of like, like defense and all that boring right. stuff. I'd say it's changing now, but when I was growing up and my mum was growing up, it's like 20 years behind the UK yeah. in certain ways. Yeah. Um, being gay, for example, um, wasn't legal until 1992. And that was the, only the one time the UK government almost did step in because everywhere else in Europe had changed the law and the other one was one of the last places. And the UK government said, look, either you have to change this law or we'll do it for you. That's incredible. What yeah. was it? I mean, 
obviously, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is, I think, in its own way, it's like, you know, it's, it's not an island at all, but it felt like yeah. that growing up. I certainly felt very isolated and um, certainly was afraid to sort of be myself. Mm -hmm. um, did that impact you, like, being on a literal island of... I'm not sure it did. I think I have always been surrounded by people in my life who I know have, will, would have always accepted me for me and also have pushed me to be me. I think one of the good things about living on somewhere so small is that like my childhood was so free and that I would run around the fields. My mum would never lock the front door. Yeah. I knew I was to come home when the, when the lampposts turned the lights on and like there was never any worry about that or I could be out with my friends when it was dark and my mum wouldn't worry that I was something bad was happening because it was so safe and like there was one year three houses got burgled and it was huge news and everyone was talking about it it's that kind of like yeah it never place, happened which that you wouldn't just wouldn't happen in a big city because I mean what an idyllic like childhood too I mean that's yeah. like kind of what I always dreamed of it, like, yeah and know. it's like that classic small town thing of at the time I resented it and couldn't wait to leave because that part of me wanted to see the world and yeah. explore and but now that I have done those things and I've explored and seen the world more than most people do in their whole lives I love going home I love oh, spending I love time that. there and I love going on oh, walks your with my dog there. yeah do you have siblings there. yeah I've got um, three siblings on my dad's side I mean and was your so you obviously wanted to like expand and leave and see the rest of the world and go to a bigger city was woo can't Antelope juice. Thank you. Was Heartstopper the first time you sort of had that opportunity to leave? Or were you already kind of finding, you know, roots on the mainland, as they say? Or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we went on a holiday and I went places and like, I went to China with my school yeah. for like three weeks, which is amazing. But right. like, I never didn't have the opportunity to leave, but Heartstopper was the first time that I like left. So Heartstopper happened for you. Were you still in high school technically? Yeah, I was doing my last two years of high school. Oh, and what was what was your plan had you not gone that? Like, where were you thinking I about going to university? I had a place at King's College in London to study history and politics. Oh, really? And I didn't actually end up getting the grades for it, but that was because I was doing my exams. I do, when it came to the time I did my exams, just after Heartstopper came out. So I would do an exam in the morning, I'd fly to London, do a TV show at night, go to a press party, get the 5 a.m. flight home, do another exam the next day, fly back by 5 p.m., be in London for the evening. I feel like, because at that point also, the show had been successful, I was like, oh, I don't need these exams. I'm not, I'm not gonna do anything with them, but I wanted to have them. Yeah, yeah, and I ended yeah. Up, I ended up doing pretty great in the exam. Not what I needed to get into King's, but right. if I'd not been partying and living yeah, my yeah, dream yeah, in that yeah, way yeah. I probably would have been better but I mean it's like you know at that time of your life it's such a you're, people are at such a crossroads and so to have opportunity like that um, you know it's it's kind of insane that that's you know you have this incredible job but also you could go to university I mean your, your life could have gone in so many different ways so many ways I'm fascinated with the way that Heartstopper came to you specifically at such a young age, specifically when you were in such an isolated part of the uh -huh. the world. From what I understand, they did a pretty wide search. Yeah. And um, you know, it ended up being like a Zoom audition situation. Yeah. Which I can't even fathom. It was also like height of COVID. So. Right. Right. I sent a headshot and then I did a self tape. And I did another self tape. And I did a Zoom call. Another Zoom call. And then they flew me to London to do an in-person chemistry read. And then after I did that, because of the COVID rules in the Isle of Man at the time, my mum and my dog had to move out of my house. Oh, I no had to way. be in the house on my own for two weeks, of which I then found out I got the job, but it was celebrating with on my own. Wait, 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 back up. So you were your mom and dog and- It was just my mom, my dog stayed. I got the dog, 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 dog company. So you had to live alone with your dog while yeah. you were waiting to see if you were gonna actually get the role. Uh -huh. Because just in case you did get the role, they needed to have you cleared to start work? No, that was just an Isle of Man law. Oh, if you, if oh, gotcha, you left, gotcha. Isle of Man in COVID, I we, see, we never really had a lockdown. We had a, we had a bit, we did have a lockdown. So when you but came it was from way shorter. Yeah, yeah, when I came back from the callback, I then had you to had isolate to at home. I see, I see, So I'd I left see. the island. And you found out in that time when you were isolated yeah. that you got the role? Yeah. By yourself and you and your dog? Yeah. That's so sweet. I know. And then my phone, my mom, and then she was at like the bottom of our driveway. 
Oh she my couldn't God. come in, but she could talk to me from like oh, the window. Oh, teary. I know. That's really sweet. She was, it was so very proud. Sweet. Yeah. She visited, she came to watch the show last week. Well, she came watch three times. Oh my um, gosh. But she, That's uh, so she, cool. Yeah. Um, and at that point, your, your acting experience was just sort of doing theater at, at your school. And yeah. The, um, the Isle of Man has an incredible Victorian theatre called the Gaiety Theatre, which um, has been incredibly well preserved and also has an incredibly highbrow amdram. Oh, like, really? Core. And so, like, from the age of eight, I will be doing a show all the time at this theatre. Yeah. I spent more time there than I did at home. Were you, like, the kid, though? Because I, I grew up with Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> And he and I did community theater together, and oh, wow. because he had already was already kind of, he, first of all, he's extremely talented, and he'd also done a few professional things at that uh -huh. time. But he was always getting like the good parts, you know. Like if I was in Peter Pan, he was going to be John, and I was going to be one of the Lost Boys. Right. If I was in Oliver, he was going to be Artful Dodger, and I was going to be like one of the Workhouse Boys, yeah. or like you know, Dodgers Gang. But like I never got the opportunity because like Neil Patrick Harris was so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so much more talented than I was. Basically, where I feel like you were the Neil Patrick Harris of your of your um, community. I mean, I don't slightly, but not really. <laughs> there was a lot of very talented people, yeah. and um, this is what the great thing about being a male in amateur dramatics is. There's not many of you, and so you were always yeah. Getting, yeah, 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 um, which is great. Yeah, but yeah. Well, I want to talk a little bit about like just first of all about to have such a huge life change happen to you during a period where. First of all, the entire world was locked down because of COVID. And then this big thing happens to you and you're sort of experiencing this thing with people who are your peers, you know, your, your actual age. I mean, Heartstopper is about, it's a coming of age story uh -huh. uh, about this kid, Charlie, who uh, is out, uh, is uh, secretly in a relationship with someone in high school and then uh, they break up and he of course has his eyes set on like the, the jock and sort of the unachievable yeah. um, guy who ends up just, the discovering that he's bisexual himself and they developed this love story together. And unlike a lot of, oh, is that our halloumi? Thank you. Have you had just the grilled halloumi by itself? No. It's so delicious. I'm not fully sure why there's grapes on it, but I think that's oh, just yeah, a I... traditional thing. <laughs> um, but what I found so remarkable about this show and what made me fall in love with it is unlike shows like, not to disparage them at all, but like Glee, where, you know, there were these high schoolers being played uh -huh. by people who, let's face it, were in their 20s. Mm -hmm. You know, what I love so much about Heartstopper is these stories were being told by the people who were living them. And it was not only, there was not only incredible representation with a bi, a bi character, a gay character, a trans character, a character who's, you know, asexual, but you were also being embodied by the, you were very close to the age of the people that you were playing. Yeah. What was it like to enter such like a monumental moment with people who were your peers? Um, I don't think we, any of us, understood that it would become a monumental moment when we went into it yeah. because Hostelbert is definitely on the lower end of like TV budgets and especially season one when no one had watched it. It was like, I mean, for us, we, knew any, we didn't know anything different because with most of our first jobs and we had the most amazing experience. It's like doing the thing you love the most, the people that you end up loving the most in the yeah. world. It's like the most magical. We have so much fun. And I'm sure. One thing that I'm, I love about it is that even, like we just finished filming season three and the pressure of it now has never affected the product, I don't think. It's, which I think is because of the relationships we have with each other right. as a cast and a crew. Yeah, because I mean, it's that thing with, with streaming shows now, and I've talked about it with some of my other friends who have been part of them. Um, but it's that very rare thing where, and this didn't happen when I was doing TV at the beginning, but like when all of, all of the show is released at one point, and in the course of 13 hours, everyone knows who you are. Yeah. And everyone has watched you do this piece of art yeah. that is incredibly complex and 13 hours long, and like, you know, full of nuance and it's it's just most people don't have to deal with that uh -huh. I mean what was that sort of overnight success I mean, like for you it was I think I went from 90,000 Instagram followers to three and a half million in two wow. days which was crazy um, and I think I would have struggled way more with everything if 
10 other people that I love dearly hadn't been going through the exact same thing at the exact same time. Yeah. And I hope that they're all my friends dearly for life, and I know they will be. But if there ever was a time that they won't, I know that we could not see each other for five years and see each other, and there's always going to be that bond between us because we went through this incredible, weird experience that no one else in the world can relate yeah. to together. But it's also great because I mean, the people like the show, and then yeah. so we and we all went on a night out that I, the season one was released, and yeah, yeah it was great. What the, I mean now, I, I think you probably recognize that your show, you know, reaches a lot of people, and I think what's so important about it is that it reaches young people, and it's being, it's young people who are producing it and making it for young people, and also obviously adults and love it as well, and actually every single person I know loves the show, but. There's got to be something really profound about knowing that you are that thing that's aspirational for a lot of kids now. I mean, and I know you've also used your platform, which I really appreciate to be, you know, vocal about LGBTQ rights and, you know, pushing boundaries forward and keep continuing to move forward. Um, I mean, what's it like to know that, that you are someone that kids look up to now and yet you're still <laughs> kind of a kid yourself? Yeah, um, it's amazing and terrifying. Uh, I'm very grateful that I have been able to be a part of something that matters so much to people. Um, I'm very grateful that people see themselves in my character and that I've, our show has been able to m mean that much to people and genuinely matter to people. But it's also quite scary. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I think there's always that like weird thing of being unable to make mistakes yourself, yeah. which is terrifying um, because I am still a kid. Uh, yeah. and I don't plan on making mistakes, but I know I will. Right. I mean. You know, you're, I mean, especially at your age right now, I feel like, you know, that, that's the age that I remember being able to make mistakes and not being under a microscope and like you're figuring out things about yourself. And I'm glad that you are still like, I like, I make mistakes. I, I, li I like that you still are allowing yourself yeah. that journey. But it is, I, I can only imagine it is a lot harder when, you know, that mistake or that choice or that, you know, tweet or whatever that, that Instagram post is now going to be like more widely scrutinized yes. and put under a microscope yeah. and it makes you think twice about things and Completely. makes you put a guard up and or well, even like most of my friends are at university and getting drunk and snogging someone in an alleyway yeah, or yeah. Like all these like things you do when you're 20 and whilst actually I don't want to do that knowing I can't do that yeah is slightly annoying yeah but also most people in the world in their whole lives can't say they've done a lot of the things that I've been able to do. And so that outweighs that a hundred times. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a gift that comes with a lot of um, drawbacks. And it's yeah. also, there are a lot of things that are so wonderful about it. Completely. I mean, that's certainly understandable. And um, certainly I, something I can relate to as well. I mean, I didn't have the success that you had at such an early age, but you know, I certainly understand what it's like to feel like the pressure of representing and being, you know, uh, a good role model uh -huh. and you know also needing to make mistakes myself and yeah. wanting the freedom to do that uh it's it's a lot it's a lot for sure i uh, something else that you know you were also i mean it, it's a privilege to be able to tell these stories but also it comes with a burden but the something i found really fascinating and a story that's not often told specifically around men and boys it's a narrative that i, I rarely see on tv was one of the eating disorder that your character Charlie suffers. And it was handled so beautifully. Can you talk a little bit about just like the pressure that, or maybe the the the, the opportunity to play that, but also the pressure that came with it? In the season that isn't out yet, we delve into that Charlie's eating disorder much more. It's yeah. pretty probably the main focus of the season. Um, and our writer, Alice, is, I never met anyone who can write such quite serious topics with such heart and such love. It's yeah. almost like she writes it whilst the audience is always the word, there's a light at the end of the channel the whole time. Yeah. Which is a great, which I don't know how, I don't know how she does it because it almost allows the audience to not stress themselves out too right, much. Right, 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 whilst right, also right. learning about a certain topic. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I, the only way I could do it whilst not stressing too much about it was not let myself put that burden on. Like just, I, all I can do is the best I can do. Yeah. And there's going to be people who think that, oh, you didn't do that right. Oh, you didn't do enough research, blah, blah, blah. But like, I can put my truth into it, and that is, that's what I do. I think you did an incredible job with it. I, I was recognizing as like an actor that that is a lot to take on, especially 
knowing that is a large platform and it is going to reach a lot of people and you want to tell those stories correctly and yeah. you want to tell them at least, listen, I mean, the, the most you can really do is tell them with, with heart and compassion and with an open, uh, mar with an open heart and also, um, you know, with as much honesty as possible. And I feel like you did such a remarkable job with that. And I think you should, you know, feel really proud of yourself for it. Thanks. Thanks and things. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess, I mean, if anything, like, I know you've just shot another season. Yes. Um, is that the last season of Heartstopper? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Did it feel like when you ended it, it could have been? Or do you think that um, it's just... I I don't know. <laughs> it, like, it, it was really... Every time we go back, it feels like going back to school again. Yeah. And, like, not in a good school. Like, not like a school you don't want to go to. Right, right, um, right. I mean, I had an amazing time, and I think it's, I think it's going to be very good. Uh, I, I don't know if it's yeah, the last one. Yeah, yeah. So you can't, you, could you tease anything about what happens? And obviously a little bit, I mean, like they delve into the yeah, it, it definitely like, condition. And it's definitely way darker than other seasons of Heartstopper have been, whilst also maintaining that it's Heartstopper. So the first half of the season, I'd say, is, is darker. The second half of the season is horny. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's how we that's how we would <laughs> unset. That's how we block them out. Um, nice, that's awesome. Which, yeah, it was a fun season to film. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, good. I'm sure you all love each other and hate we do. to be away from each other. I know with Modern Family, you know, we'd go away for these summer hiatuses and like we would have this text chain between the entire cast checking in with one another yeah. and like we just didn't want to be apart from one yeah. another. And you know, it is really lovely when you do know you get to see them again in a few uh -huh. months, but. I can't imagine like leaving this group of people not knowing like if it's over or not. Yeah, it's, it was a weird feeling. Yeah, it's a weird feeling. Or have any of them come to New York to see you so um, far? Yaz came a few weeks ago. He plays L. Yeah. Um, few of them, a few of them I know have plans to come, which is really nice. That's great. I can't wait. Uh, oh, thank you. Yes, Grinch is over one. there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Mmm. Mmm. -mm. Mm. Incredible. What has it been like for you? I mean, you've lived your entire life with social media, which I have a love-hate relationship with. I'm sure most people do. What has that been like for you just navigating that, sort of always having this thing be a part of your existence? Yeah, I, I always say that I feel very lucky in that like social media, as we know, it didn't really become a thing until I was 12 or 13. So for most of my childhood, I didn't have iPads and iPods and like the old ones, like the first iPhone came out when right. I was six, I think. Right. Which I feel very lucky for. Yeah. Um, but we were also like the first generation which that makes me had feel very old, but yes. <laughs> social media in high school. Yeah. I hate social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't keep myself off it. Um, right. Did you come out on social media at <laughs> one point and then like not when I was or, like 12, rescind it? Or I, when I was 12, I had told my mom. Uh huh. And she's amazing because my mom was amazing. And felt so overjoyed. I was like, I need to tell everyone. So I put it on my Instagram and then quickly realized that, actually, no, Joe, you were ready to tell your mum, but you, you weren't ready to tell the world. Right, right. Deleted it, told everyone I was, I got hacked. And then like, Smart. sort of, something went back in the closet. <laughs> and then like, slowly told all my friends again. They were like, oh yeah, you, you told us two years ago. Like, Aww. we know. That's sweet. Then I never really like came out. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a beautiful thing that you didn't have to and that you just sort of got to be you and yeah. people understood. I think that's actually really wonderful and progressive, actually. When I read that you had come out, I mean, first of all, it made me think of your character. There's a lot of parallels yeah. with uh, you and Kit's characters and, and your real lives. I mean, and social media plays such a big part in Heart, mm. Heartstopper, um, and, and, you know, I'm sure there was a lot for you to draw from. It's, yeah, which actually not as much as people think. Yeah. I think I'm very, very, very different to Charlie, which... Um, In what ways? He, I'm not as quiet as him. Um, he is way more accepting of himself than I was when I was his age. Mm. There are definitely very, a lot of similarities to us, but I, I like that there are a lot of differences too. Um, yeah. I think I'm way more loud and outspoken than he is. Yeah. He's braver than me. Charlie's definitely way braver than me. In different ways. I can win an argument every time. I know I've got a very sharp tongue, so I don't think Charlie could, but I would never ask to kiss a boy I liked or 
joining a rugby team because I liked a guy. I, I would never be able to do that because I'm not brave enough. Yeah. Whereas Charlie would. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's weird. I think also part of me wants to make myself less like Charlie because the world sees me as him. Right. And like, I don't know. I don't know. What's it been like being here in the States and having fans come up to you? I always find it interesting when I, when I go to a place that's not home and people somehow are still connected to me or yeah. feel like they have they know me or have some ownership of me or, you know, just even though the, the fact that they're fans of like something that I do uh-huh. is really crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, I still find it weird that people know who I am. Yeah. <laughs> or care what I do in my life. I, I, I find it weird, not in like a weird, and like it's just a strange thing. Yeah. But one amazing thing with Hearts of fans especially is I have, okay, maybe once or twice, but never felt like anyone has pushed a boundary or everyone I ever meet in the street is so lovely and wants to tell me the reason that my show meant so much to them, which is an incredible thing and is very special. Yeah. It's also weird and can be quite overwhelming because these people you've never met are telling you that how your show got them out of their deepest, darkest moments in life. And yeah. it's, it's a lot to take on, but also is amazing in itself. And I, yeah. Truly. Amazingly um, beautiful. Yeah, I can only imagine that it's 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 also just really got to be hard at that age navigating that thing, and also being in a new city, you yeah. know. Um, how has it been dating as someone who is on TV, uh-huh. and you know, at that age where you should this is like when you really should be exploring? And I don't know. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. It's weird. I don't follow any of my friends, family people I might be dating or not on Instagram because I have this inherent fear and stress that when I did, they would get messages from people trying to get to me. Right. And I had this fear and inherent stress that I hate the idea of my career and my choices in life affecting them. Yeah. Or negatively impacting them in any way. Yeah. And also, I think because I'm so, there's still most of me that's not used to this life, keeping the people I care about and love separate yeah. to the Joe who is a public figure makes things easier. And I, I think I always will be a very private person. Like I, I don't think I'm ever gonna, hey, if Vogue ever one day wanna sponsor my wedding, that's very different. Yeah. But yeah, 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 yeah. I'm never gonna be like posting my significant other on my social media or doing things if I'm dating someone in that. And, I think if that was to happen, they would think that was because of them, but actually it's the opposite. It's right. like, no. I struggled for a while juggling that. And I think I've come to the conclusion that like people who really love me in my life don't care. Right. <laughs> I don't follow them on Instagram. Right. And we've talked about it and they know and like, and right. I don't know, it just... I mean, it's um, a brave thing. It, you know, setting boundaries is incredibly important, especially when you are a public figure. And how do you handle the pressure to be more open when you want to keep yourself, you want, you want to keep things private. Uh-huh. Um, I'm asking because I'm curious because I like to do it more myself. <laughs> I have learned that sometimes you have to be a bit of a selfish. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And that isn't, doesn't, that doesn't make you a bad person. Yeah. I What's can? that? I can say a selfish cunt. Yeah, you can you say have selfish to be a selfish cunt. cunt. <laughs> um, Sometimes just be a Did you see and... Olivia Coleman recently say that that oh, was yeah. her favorite password? She's told me that before. Oh, she has? Yeah. Because yeah. I was saying when, I, when we were on Hearts about, I was like, my favorite piece of your work is in Fleabag when Andrew Scott leaves and you just scream. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's my yeah. favorite scene of anyone ever. So good. Yeah, it was amazing to get to work with her. She's, she's a very amazingly talented, incredible yeah. person. I mean, look at all these amazing women you're collecting. Olivia no. Coleman, Patti LuPone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sutton Foster now. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about your um, your the first night you went on for Sweeney Todd. After this, after the day after, Tommy Kale, the director, came to my dressing room and he was like, "So how was yesterday?" And I remember he, oh, he didn't me, see it. No, no, he he did, but he asked me how, oh, how okay, it was. Okay. Um, and he, he he told me to write this down, and I said to him, "I'll remember the bits of yesterday that I remember for the rest of my life," <laughs> because most of it was a blur. The bits I do remember, I'm going to treasure for the ever. Do you share like what what those memories were? So the start of the show, we all come up in like a lift. Yes. And then coming up in the lift, and then like that, like the applause of the I don't know audience. I remember that. I don't remember anything from Pirelli's, which is my first song. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's just that song is 
the hardest. It's such a tongue twister. It's the most, like, at one point Sondheim rhymes the word by in eight different harmonies. People saying like, oh, I'm passing by. Oh, I want to buy one. Oh, bye bye. Like all, everyone, like everyone starts singing at a different time, singing completely different notes, but has it's to say so the word by at exactly the same time. And it's, that song, now I'm what, 35 shows in, I'm still like, one, two, three, yeah, sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, one, and one, and boot, and like every in my head, but I have to because I just can't. It's so complicated. That's incredible. Um, but I remember um, Delaney, who was playing Mrs. Lover at the time for my first show, I remember singing Not All I'm Round with her, and then sitting on her lap and her just squeezing me while the applause happened. I just started crying. Like, it was like, oh. I was like but yeah. Did you ever sing that song before? I, I, I knew the song, but I hadn't sang it. I, I mean, it's one of Sondheim's most beautiful. It's, yeah, I mean, pieces. I'm biased, but it's probably. My I mean, favorite. Barbara Streisand sang it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's something you share with Barbara Streisand. Hey. You both sung, not while I'm around, professionally for mm-hmm. money. That's a big deal, Joe. It's a big deal. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. So, what's gonna happen after Sweeney Todd closes for you? I'm gonna go on holiday. <laughs> are you gonna go back to the Isle of Man? Or are you going back to England? Um, I'm gonna you... go back to the Isle of Man for a few weeks, but. My base is London now, so I'll probably spend most of my time in London. But I want to go somewhere hot for a week. Yeah, you should do not there. Um, well, you are a very welcome addition to Broadway. I, I was really stunned by, I mean, I already knew you were a talented actor, but your voice is incredible. Oh, thank you. I want to see more of you on, on New York stages. I think you're, you're born to be on a New York stage or a London. You can do a theater in the West End too. Uh-huh. I'll allow that. Um, but you're really wonderful. And thank you I'm very just much. so thrilled that I got to meet you. And, Truly, I mean, Heartstopper is such a special show, and I hope you know what a special thing it is that you're a part of. Thank you. I was stunned. Thanks for having lunch with me. Thanks for having lunch with me. (laughs) I didn't eat much, but to be honest, I'm completely hungover. So, (laughs) are you really? I was going to the dentist this morning. Oh, I know. I did hear that. So my mouth's still a little bit numb. So. Oh my god. (laughs) I cracked my tooth on. I don't know what you'd call it, but in the UK we call it a flapjack, but it's not a pancake. Yeah, flap. You cracked your tooth on a flapjack. Yeah. But not, was a, not a pancake, one of the like oats and... We yeah. put like the bottom of a, a Heath bar in it and it melted to the bottom of it and then Wait, went there was rock a Heath salt. bar in, the, in your flapjack? Where did you get this flapjack? Flapjacks, I'm th- we're talking about very different things. Okay, you tell me what you're talking about. Flapjacks to me are like oats and syrup in like a bar. Okay. Like a granola bar basically. Okay. But we mixed in like little bits of Heath bar which we didn't think about that would melt and go to the bottom. So I took a bite out of it and crack. By toffee. Yeah, like hard, rock hard. Well, yeah, you got to get that tooth fixed, especially um, for yeah. singing song time. I know. You'll be whistling out the side of your mouth. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming to me with a, with a half numb tooth mouth. Half numb tooth mouth. But yeah, it's oh. fixed now. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Next week on Dinners on Me, it's the mysterious masked country crooner, Orville Peck. We'll get into the evolution of his persona, how he found country music while growing up in South Africa, and how wearing a mask allows him to be more authentic and vulnerable. Dinners on Me is a production of Sony Music Entertainment and a kid named Beckett Productions. It's hosted by me, Jesse Tyler Ferguson. It's executive produced by me and Jonathan Hirsch. Our showrunner is Joanna Clay. Our associate producer is Angela Vang. Sam Baer engineered this episode. Hans Dale She composed our theme music. Our head of production is Sammy Allison. Special thanks to Tamika Balance Kolasny and Justin Makita. I'm Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Join me next week. <laughs>